I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from across Ukraine, discuss the issues faced by Ukrainian refugees in Britain, and Dom Nichols interviews Tom Tuchenhardt, the UK's Ministry of State for Security. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday the 30th of March, one year and 34 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by former NATO commander Hamish de Bratton-Gordon, Ukrainian journalist Maria Romanenko, and British journalist Harriet Marston. I started by asking Hamish for the latest updates from the battlefront. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. And David, it's a real delight to be here in in Telegraph Towers doing it live, as it were. I think a really fascinating last 24 hours, as usual. But um, certainly what's happening on the ground, very much focused around Bakhmut, a serious fighting going on there. Uh, Interesting comments coming out from General Riley, uh, General Miley, rather, head of the Joint Chiefs, saying that the Russian forces are being slaughtered over the last 21 days in Bakhmut. And some of those casualty rates are absolutely unbelievable. In fact, I think Ben Wallace, the UK Defence Minister yesterday, said 220,000 Russian soldiers dead or injured since the start of this conflict. And although we don't have the exact figures from Ukraine, you know, very much significantly less from that. The other significant issues over the last 24 hours, a number of HIMARS, precision artillery strikes into Mariupol that was captured earlier on in the conflict, and also reports potentially into Crimea too. People are drawing, are making views about potentially the much vaunted spring offensive and some what we'd call deep operations uh, happening. We'll have to see about that. I think the other area of interest, we've got uh, Senor Grossi, head of the International Atomic Energy Agency was at uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power station over the last 24 hours saying, again, reiterating what a challenging place this is and how difficult it is. And with all the nuclear rhetoric at the moment, we've discussed uh, the tactical nuclear weapons being moved into Belarus and a number of other issues. You know, I've written about it. Others have written about it. I still think it's a lot of bluff and bluster and shows of desperation, and we should not overly worry ourselves about it. A couple of other bits on the military. I've had a lot of very interesting meetings over the last um, 24 hours, and a couple of things, I think, to think about over the next few days or so. The first one, Gerasimov, the Grand Commander, approaching 100 days, a pretty disastrous 100 days. One's not entirely sure where the Russians can go next. He was there to replace Varkin, who had failed, Uh, Gerasimov has also failed. They are, and with others, moving slightly away and recorded uh, or um, over-recorded, overheard calls between oligarchs losing faith in Putin. You know, things seem to be on the slide. And the, and the, the other bit, I'll just before, before I stop and hand over, reports coming out of the recruitment the Russians are doing. Apparently, they have a group of about 4 million people. They're recruiting people with, with low IQs, people who won't be noticed uh, if they disappear, that, that's orphans, that's people who are living ref. I mean, completely cynical. And nobody sort of from around Moscow or, or the other big cities. These are people way in, way in the east. And uh, I understand their life expectancy is about a week. Most of these recruits who are brought in with virtually no training are either killed or injured within a week and off the front line. And that backs up what the American, the Joint Chiefs are saying, and also the casualty rates that Ben Wallace is saying. So a very interesting time, as we also know that a lot of modern Western armour is now grumbling around in Ukraine. So I'll just stop there. Over. 
Thanks, Hamish. Just very quickly, could I get your reaction to seeing the the tanks that seeing the tanks arrive in Ukraine that previously you, you'd have presumably been hearing on Salisbury Plain, close to where you live, uh, that you've talked to us, you've talked to us about before the experience of hearing the Ukra- Ukrainians practice with the vehicles, and now they're there. It'd be good to hear your reaction, your thoughts on that, and just just a, a quick sense of what impact this could have on the battlefront. Well, I, I think there are a number of things to consider here, David, and everybody that uh, they have arrived un unhindered it is you know one expects the russians have been doing all they can to try and what we call interdict the lines of communications uh, and they have failed and the poles uncovered a russian spy ring ring over the, only the last couple of days so the fact they've got all, all got there with you know not a picture from when they left bovington a few weeks ago to when they arrived in Ukraine. And I understand from people who were training them that uh, you, th- these people are, re- you know, they were really impressed. These people know what they're doing. They seem to be very competent, not just at learning how to drive Challenger 2, but also how to manoeuvre, use them. So this armoured manoeuvre that myself and Dom have spoken about over the last few months, the ability to operate with artillery and infantry and air power, you know, I'm getting more and more confident they really know what they're doing. And with the Russians being so static, somebody down the road from here mentioned this morning, the Russians are fighting like the first half of the First World War, you know, with no integration, no air power. So when you look at these modern Western tanks like Challenger and Leopard, you put it together with this combined arms manoeuvre that we think they're going to do. I think they're going to have a pretty devastating effect. Now, they're going to be concentrated. They'll concentrate that Western armour to punch through in good old sort of terminology that we use in the military, the swear point, um, the shock action, and then to get behind the enemy, get behind the Russians. And all, let's not forget, they've got a lot of old Russian tanks and armour as well that can flow through. So from looking at them on the ground, and there's a key, is a moral morale point here. You know, it's very good psychologically for the Ukrainian morale and very bad. At, well, there is no morale in the Russian army. We, we've seen that. We know that they have people, regulars behind the front line who are shooting anybody who, who turns around. So there is no morale. So I would hope and expect that these modern Western tanks allied with the HIMARS and everything else are going to have a significant impact. But I think the Ukrainians are going to be very canny. We don't really know what they're doing. They've got all these this armour there with, without the general public finding out the next few months. It's going to be interesting. And certainly one doesn't want to give any ideas to the, to the Russians, but I think myself and others are pretty confident they're going to do the business. Thank you very much, Hamish. We'll come back to you later, I think. I've got a few more questions, but it'd be great to hear from our guests, Maria and Harriet. Thank you so much, for joining us. I want to turn to a completely different topic, really. Maria, you've joined us before to talk about the Ukrainian experience in the United Kingdom, specifically in Manchester, where you're living. One of the big pieces of news over the last 12 months, and longer really for us Brits, has been the cost of living crisis. It's been a really big thing. If people listening in from the States or from elsewhere, it's really a thing that's dominated the news. Inflation is going up, rent is going up. And I wanted to bring you and Harriet on just to talk about your experiences um, dealing with this. So just Maria first, maybe. As we've said, big thing in the UK, the cost of living crisis. How has it affected the Ukrainians who have settled here? Thank you. Well, obviously it affects everybody and it affects the Ukrainians who have settled here, but also their hosts. So the, in terms of the hosts, that they receive the standard £350 per month. And that's irrespective of whether they look after one or a big family of Ukrainians. And in year two, that rises to £500. Some local authorities, of course, are opting, opting to supplement this figure. And there have been a number of concerns that this figure simply doesn't cover the cost of household bills due to the significant increase. And whilst finance isn't often the main motivator, there also isn't necessarily the inclination to lose money while hosting Ukrainians. And of course, hosts can ask guests to contribute to bills, but often they feel uncomfortable because they know that Ukrainians are on low income and they need to save money in order to move on to their own accommodation in the future. And the combination of this has led to a number of hosting relationships breaking down. And for Ukrainians specifically, the issues that they face are around two issues. The first is heating and the costs for hosts. So in Ukraine, heating is um, centrally controlled uh, and it normally comes on in October and it's turned off in April. 
So you pay a set amount based on the size of your property and a number of people registered to live in that property. And as a result of this, Ukrainian properties are often well heated throughout the winter and to a decent temperature. And that's obviously not financially feasible in the UK. So Ukrainians are often cold when they're here in the UK. They also often on universal credit or they get low paid jobs. And so any price rises have a huge automatic knock on effect. And they also don't necessarily have access to savings to rely on. And those savings that they had, they would see them decline by 20% because of the change in the exchange rate. And there is further pressure on Ukrainians to send money home to support families back in Ukraine, as obviously Ukraine's unemployment has um, hugely increased in the last year and people are struggling there. Thank you very much, Maria. I'll come back to you in a moment. But Harriet Marsden, can I bring you in here? You've had a personal experience to, to do with what we've just been talking about. Can you talk us through your story? Hi. Yeah, no. So I have been hosting now since last the beginning of last May. So I signed up on the first day when the scheme first opened. And although I have been incredibly lucky in how well I get on with my guests, and we're both, we have a lot in common, both young women working from home alone, self-employed, we have encountered so much difficulty with this scheme that actually I'm I'm surprised that more host guest arrangements have broke haven't broken down and already we know of as Maria was saying I think the estimates now are approximately 10 between 10 and 20 percent the scheme has been for want of a better word a complete shambles uh for three reasons firstly in the beginning there was the bureaucracy the difficulty of doing things like the applications for the brp national insurance number the job center alone was a complete nightmare the universal credit system just unworkable really for arriving refugees so the bureaucratic aspect and in, in terms of uh, money as well lost income accompanying her to all of these appointments and helping with all these applications was enormous then there was the lack of support so there was no way to be connected with any other hosts the council hadn't were overwhelmed and frankly were useless anyway the refugee council stepped in quite a bit later and although they were amazing we waited about six months for that help and so there was no way to even know who else was hosting and to ask for help or advice from anything. I tried calling the DWP, the Home Office. I got completely conflicting information from everywhere. The job center was, I mean, it was a joke. And then finally, the psychological aspect, which involved taking in someone who was extremely traumatized and trying to help them deal with everything here and assimilate and not being trained or prepared in any way to do that and the emotional burden of feeling responsible for your guest feeling like you had signed up to give a room but turning into an unpaid and untrained caseworker so despite all of that I've been extremely lucky but I know of more people that have been unlucky and more guests that have been unlucky with this scheme than those who have been lucky. Thanks, Harry. Just staying with you for a moment, could you talk a little bit about, about what she's doing now and how the rise in inflation, and as, as we've all seen, I think, re- especially renting in London, the increase in rent, how, how has that impacted her? Oh, hugely. I mean, her plan originally was after spending a year with me to stay on in London and to rent privately. That is completely impossible, not only because of a lack of, of income, or she doesn't have enough income, even if she got the full universal credit housing benefits as a young woman without any dependents, she really doesn't have a chance financially. But also with the London rental situation being what it is, she didn't even get a look in to even view flats, you know? I mean, because she has to declare that she's on benefits, she doesn't have any rental history, she doesn't have a guarantor, she doesn't have a massive deposit, and her English, while good, isn't fluent. All of those things meant that she, not only can she not rent a flat in London, so she didn't even get a single appointment to see one. So it, it, she's actually now decided that she is moving to Poland, where she will be able to afford groceries and afford a flat and be able to get a job and be able to work and live in a way that she has not found possible here. And it's, you know, it's devastating for her. That's an extremely, extremely sad story. Maria, would you like to come in on that? Does that, does the experience, does Harriet's experience kind of chime with you a little bit? Do you see similarities in in, in the details there? Uh, Yeah, I think... um... I think she described it really well. The main issue is obviously that Ukrainians here are either in low paid um, employment or no employment at all. And with the language provision that's been given by the government, the level that they need to get to in order to get a sort of 
decently paid job it will take them years. And I know there's from hosting my mom as well. Obviously, some local authorities are handling this a bit better. London has always been a big problem. And the, the other problem is that a lot of Ukrainians seem to think that all the jobs and all the opportunities are in London. So when they come, look to come to the UK, they search for hosts in London because like in Ukraine and many other countries, the capital is always the go-to place. But that's obviously not the case in the UK. A lot of cities, including Manchester, where I am, have a lot of opportunities. Housing... Yeah, it's uh, obviously that the private rental prices have increased at 4.5% in the last 12 months. But at the same time, the housing element has not increased. So this creates a lot of issues that Ari Harriet has described. And obviously, the requirement for deposit and credit check and work history, that's making it more complicated. In my, in my area, there's been sufficient help. So my mom's been able to move on to a private accommodation that is covered by her house and element of her universal credit. So they've been doing quite a fantastic job by approaching private landlords and asking them to agree to being paid through universal credit. So that's how they handle it here. And that's actually been working pretty well. And I've come into contact with several Ukrainians who've been able to move on privately. But obviously, I live in Stockport, which is um, a lot smaller than London. Absolutely. Thank you, Maria and Harriet. I mean, the reason I wanted to talk about this is partly because obviously... You know, as journalists, we all have eyes on this because we're based in the UK. We're based in London. Maria, you're up in Manchester. So I would say to our listeners, if we are very interested about the experience of Ukrainians across the world, wherever they've gone to, because it feels like it's an incredibly important story. It feels like it got a lot of coverage at the, and we want to keep up the pressure there and talk about some of the issues, the good and the bad that they're facing. So today, obviously, we're talking about the experience in Britain. But please do get in touch if you know of stories from where you are, from where you're listening. Harriet, can I come to you? You've described very eloquently and passionately the issues and the problems faced by your guest would you tell us a little bit more about maybe the some of the more positive aspects you said you were you, you, it's been a you know been a pleasure to welcome her and to, and to help her could you talk to us maybe a little bit about the positive sides of the last year yeah absolutely I, I definitely don't want to only focus on the negatives I mean getting to know someone who's been coming from that kind of background and everything that's going on in in Ukraine has been really invaluable in terms of humanizing such an incomprehensible the scale of the disaster and the scale of the trauma being able to get to know someone on a personal level day in day out and hear about her family and her friends both back in ukraine and also to who have gone elsewhere has been just an amazing insight and also just such a great exchange of culture as well like we've had ukrainian cooking nights i've taken her to all the museums ukrainian humor as i've experienced it is incredibly dry witty they're very funny very direct so being able to kind of introduce her to my culture and also hear and experience a bit of hers has been incredible that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. What was your what did you present as the sort of best of British, may I ask? Well, we we have quite different interests. So I didn't really go in hard on the pub side of things because she's very much more interested in gaming and art and science. So we did like Natural History Museum, Science Museum, the Jurassic Park exhibition, which is great. Uh, I took her to see a musical to see Wicked and the Harry Potter musicals as well. She's very into magic. Went to the Tower of London. We got food poisoning at Wagamama's so that was interesting just um yeah it's uh, it's, it's been really uh, enriching in that way I think for both of us and also probably very good for me as a journalist to be able to really experience in depth what it's actually like as a refugee to arrive here even in these specific special circumstances with a lot of public sympathy and the absolutely the Kafkaesque nightmare that was the job centre situation has been really valuable to me as a journalist too. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, I mean, food poisoning at Wagamama is really the height of British cultural experience. Maria and Harry, can I ask you both? We've talked a lot about some of the issues faced and it's been interesting to hear that, you know, it does sound from Maria, what you said, that different local authorities are sort of, some are, some are quite good, some some really struggle. Um, what, in, in, in both of your view, what do you think, what, are there any, what should the government be doing? What, what could be done now to help these people who are suffering from things like the cost of living crisis, seeing their rent go up? Are there, are there things that from your experience that you'd recommend Maria and Harriet? Maybe Maria, would you like to take that first? Uh, yes, well, definitely. There's, we know that there used to be a uh, over ten thousand pounds of provision for of funding for every Ukrainian adult, and then it's slightly smaller for children. And to this day, I still haven't figured out where does that money go. And when you ask specifically, you know, like my mom needed a dentist uh, last summer. 
uh, she had a teeth fall out, so it was quite serious, but she couldn't find a dentist here, you know, without paying privately, which nobody can afford. And we were like, well, we have this money, can we use it for a dentist? And we were told, no, you can't. So you can, you just can't pick and choose where this money goes and nobody really knows where exactly it goes. So that's quite sad because from my experience, a lot of Ukrainians have individual needs, you know, they need something for the children, for example, or they need uh, dental care and it's just impossible to control how that money is spent and same with housing as we discussed earlier there's a lot of ukrainians who go through a homelessness route and homelessness route costs loads and loads for the governments and for local authorities and it takes a while to find and ukrainians are put up in hotels for months and months and it takes a long time to find housing but some ukrainians even told me like if they gave this money that they use for these hotels to us we would have been able to find something already ourselves. It's just that they don't have, they can't control what, how the money is used. Obviously, the English lesson lessons is a big one. My mom arrived here and she was offered two half days per week of English classes. As, as I said, we calculate that would take her like two or three years to get to the level that's good enough to be hired anywhere in customer facing positions. She had the time, she was able to attend full time lessons. But she was just, you know, there was no way of getting more lessons. So that would definitely help Ukrainians to be more confident in speaking English if they had more language provision. I would say, as I said before, maybe some sort of advertisement to tell Ukrainians don't go to London because London is really expensive, as Harriet has been pointing out. That there are opportunities outside of London. There's work opportunities. There's housing opportunities. Um, and there is still obviously some resentment from me in terms of how the UK is the only country in Europe that requires visas for Ukrainians to come here. Um, I guess looking at, that, looking at how the government is failing to handle and house asylum seekers, it's unrealistic to, expand, to expect that this will change. And as for the community, I look at what I'm doing to help Ukrainians settle in here and without blowing my own trumpet. I hope that it might inspire others to do the same in their areas. So I run free walking tours of Manchester for Ukrainians. Um, the next one is this Sunday. That's been incredibly popular so far. I, would, I will have introduced 15% of Ukrainians in Greater Manchester to the city. And I'm planning out, I'm planning to do this in Liverpool as well around Eurovision time. So, you know, people can do things like this. This ha ha helps people settle in. And there's been a lot of interest, as I said. We met up with Lancashire Creative Club earlier this week and we talked about doing some sort of fun day or sports day for Ukrainians where the, the Ukrainian kids can learn cricket. And that's obviously the highest of um, British culture. And maybe, and that was actually inspired by our previous uh, time I was on uh, the Telegraph podcast where we discussed. Uh, the scone and jam and clotted cream sort of challenge for Ukrainians. So, so for any community, you know, get involved in making Ukrainians feel welcome. The bright, the the bold, the wacky, just maybe not so much of the queuing or the food poison at Wagamama's. Thank you, Maria. Harriet, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think Maria is absolutely right. The question of where all this money has gone and what is being spent on is a huge, huge, huge question mark. I know that there was a village that had a, a, a local authority that had taken three, <clears throat> three guests in the area, and it's it's it hasn't yet been satisfactory to explain what they've done with the rest of the money that they've received because it's certainly nothing to the tune of the total that they've received of each borough, each local authority. I have no idea what they're doing with the money. We had a similar situation with an emergency dental appointment that we couldn't get and then we couldn't pay for. No support from the council for that, no support from the government either. I'd probably say that the most important thing the government could be doing is consistency of communication and information. I mean, we've had information coming in drips and drabs and there's this press release and that's announced in the news, but then this is a rumour on the Facebook groups, but then that's come from the council, but then that's been clarified by the Refugee Council and nobody seems to know what is going on. At any point, nobody has had a clear idea of where this scheme has been going, what the problems are going to be or what the provisions for those problems will be. So communication is really important. I mean, what I've been hearing from my council, my borough, over and over again is we're waiting on central government. We don't know about central government. We haven't heard anything. So that's a problem. I also think that the uh, the fact that the Refugee Council will be withdrawing their support now is really going to be a huge problem. They've been much, much more helpful and supportive than either the government or local authority. And... Um, 
it's also, I don't know if, if we've spoken about this before, but the scheme has in fact been closed by the back door very quietly, which I don't know if it, a lot of people know. They've increased the monthly payments from 350 to 500, but only for a household that is hosting a guest that's already been in the country for 12 months or more, which is to say that it's been disincentivized to take a new refugee, which means there's no way that anybody would want to take on the burden of supporting a new guest in the country with all of its associated bureaucracy and appointments and also receive nearly half of what someone else would be receiving for a guest that was here already and has assimilated, probably knows the language better, maybe has a job, is set up with BRP and NI number and everything. So that's a huge problem, particularly as there's a lot of tension among uh, among hosts with all the different local authorities giving different winter payments, different cost of living payments, now different support payments as well. It's created unnecessary tension and competition. So I think, yeah, consistency and communication and an explanation of where the money has gone. Well, thank you, Maria and Harriet. Just to repeat, this is, of course, um, an episode devoted really just to understanding some of the issues in the UK and in England, and Maria in Manchester and Harriet in London. But of course, listeners, if you see things, if you please do let us know what's happening in your country. It's a story which we really want to stay on top of. Stay on top of. It's very important to us. So do let us know what's happening in your country as well. Just to finish, Maria, you were at England-Ukraine, the Euros qualifying match last Sunday. It'd be really, really good to know what you made of it, your trip down to Wembley, and what was it like sitting in, in the Ukrainian crowd? Oh, it was uh, absolutely fantastic to be, well, both uh, pre-match, there was a gathering at a pub near near Wembley Stadium of Ukrainians, and it was a fantastic atmosphere there, lots of singing, lots of shouting, uh, some drinking only a little bit. Then, uh, the you know, the, at the stadium itself, uh, we had over 4,000 Ukrainian fans. It was great to see that uh, 1,000 refugees were uh, given free tickets as well. I was, was sat in the Ukraine sector with uh, the over 4,000 uh, Ukrainians who paid or people who supported Ukraine. The atmosphere, I would say, was more relaxed than it was in the matches against uh, Scotland and Wales that I attended last summer. Uh, it was fantastic to have been able to sing Ukrainian songs and to hear the national anthem of Ukraine sung at Wembley. It definitely brought a tear to my eye and was respected by the England fans. And I think there was a lot of mutual respect uh, between the two. I saw definitely a lot of half and half scarves, which I think are normally frowned upon. But I saw English people just buying them and supporting them. And that was great. The match itself was obviously quite a disappointment uh, with the result. And I was even more disappointed with the performance itself. There were some Ukrainian stars that definitely could have delivered more, such as Mudrik. He was poor like the others. But it was also Ruslan Vatan's debut as temporary manager of the Ukraine team. We don't know how long. We know that Rebro is supposed to step in, but we don't know how soon. But I know that Ruslan Vatan is not really supposed to be staying there for a while. So hopefully under the next manager, Ukraine will show a much better performance. Well, thank you very much, Maria and Harriet. Well, let's go to our final thoughts. Hamish de Bratton Gordon, you've been listening to all of that. It'd be interesting to hear your reaction to it, but also to hear what you'll be looking at over the next few days and what's occupying your mind when looking at the battlefront. Thank you. Well, well absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, some of the issues that the, the people who've come over here are suffering is shocking. Uh, and I hope, I hope the government's listening and make sure that, uh, that um, our friends from Ukraine who we're looking after, well, uh, we help their military get rid of uh, Putin, are properly looked after and uh, want for nothing. And just uh, sort of moving on to my sort of final thoughts, I, I rather, there are two things I just want to briefly cover. I rather glibly dismiss the nuclear threat and that, that bears a little bit of an explanation I think particularly if those if anybody's seen the, the piece on the BBC website today an interview with Dmitry Muratov who is a Nobel winner and journalist talking very much about he, he was a bit concerned about Putin and whether he would press a red button or not I think the reason that I'm pretty demonstrative that that he won't is because he has used the nuclear issue to keep NATO out of the Ukraine fight and it clearly hasn't worked, or it has worked that the fact that there are not NATO boots on the ground, and he absolutely knows that if he does do something nuclear, then NATO will get fully involved. NATO has the precision strike, the missiles, etc., to really finish off the Russian military 
uh, and hence finish off Putin. That's why I am confident that we will not go nuclear. And that sort of leads on to my final point. Again, from interesting discussions I've had around town over the last 24 hours, that the Russian military is decimated and it's going to take it decades to get back. 1,900 tanks destroyed, at least in the last um, 13 months. It would appear they're pretty much out of precision guided weaponry. The view that they're even having to take electronics out of washing machines to try and cobble together stuff, I think that is very significant. And at the moment, as, as I mentioned earlier, they, they are using First World War tactics. They have these allegedly 4 million people who that they're prepared to throw at the problem. And the final piece here is the Russian Air Force. Where is the Russian Air Force? It just hasn't performed. It just hasn't got involved. And, you know, everybody talks about air power being the overriding power in these sort of conflicts. And to me, the only thing that Putin has left, really, um, at the end of this is possibly his air force. We know the Russian Navy is in a shocking state as well. So when puts all that together, I think uh, w- if we see the Russian Air Force appear over the next few weeks or so, I would be surprised. And I think it is, it is really up to, it'll be the Ukrainians who decide this. And no doubt at some time there will be negotiations on where we go. But uh, we're in a much better position. The Ukrainians much better position than perhaps they were 12 months ago. And as I reiterate, we are very confident in their capability and the Ukrainian military capability to push this forward, get on the front foot, and hopefully bring this dreadful war to a close as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Hamish. Harriet Marston, what are your final thoughts? Uh, Just to reiterate what's been said before, really, I think that the courage and the spirit and the capability shown by the Ukrainian people, both here and in Ukraine and elsewhere in the world, has been incredible and should be celebrated no matter how much that it's important that we talk about the negatives and the devastation and the catastrophe that is this war and this displacement of people. I think it's really valuable to know just how much of an incredible fight, both in terms of military and in terms of the psychology and the the strength that is being demonstrated by Ukrainians is incredible. Thank you, Hamish and Harriet. Maria Romanenko, would you like the very final thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I agree with everything that Hamish and Harriet said. Um, I think it's good to reach right to people. I get asked a lot of the time, oh, but Russia has a very strong army. But it's like, well, it doesn't, though. It doesn't, because we have seen how things have been developing in the last uh, year and still are. So we're all hoping for victory. Uh, Ukrainians have shown a lot of resilience, both the ones who stayed, but also the ones who are here. They're not classical refugees. They actually want to go back to Ukraine. They can't at the moment because it's unsafe, but they kind of end up living a dual life and attempting to settle in, but with no real desire to do so and having one foot out of the door. So they they doing really well here and it's important to keep supporting them and asking the government to do the same. Hi folks, Don Nichols here. I grabbed some time earlier this week with Tom Tugendhat, the security minister. We discussed all things Ukraine and how intelligence is used in the modern world. We also talked about the government's new idea to have an open source intelligence hub to hoover up all the publicly available data to try and make sense of this confusing world. We discussed the morality of AI and machine learning and where the moral compass is when we start allowing robots and all things uh, electronic into providing intelligence for us. So, Security Minister Tom Tugendhat, thank you so much for making time to chat to The Telegraph. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to talk a bit about your announcement about the government's open source intelligence hub and taking a bit of Ukraine, a bit of intelligence more broadly. But first things first, I presume it's a prerequisite of your job as Security Minister that you have to be a massive James Bond fan. Inspector, you'll remember Andrew Scott, the evil C, trying to put together this intelligence hub that sucks open source data from around the world to turn into product. How is the open source intelligence hub that the government announced any different from that? And who controls the moral compass? So the reality is that there is already an enormous amount of data online. We all know that the number of photographs that people are putting on Facebook or Instagram, the number of 
messages that people are putting on Twitter. And of course, the number of blogs. I don't know how many of your colleagues have started a sub stack in recent years. There's an absolute ton of information that's out there. There's also, of course, a ton of information that's out there from satellite photographs. We're used to Google Earth, but there are actually many others out there nowadays. And there's a whole series of ways in which people are putting information out there. So this isn't a question of the government sucking everything in, but rather understanding what's already out there. The reality is that intelligence has changed. We started off, when was it, five, six, seven hundred years ago, maybe even a few thousand years ago, with intelligence looking into different people around the world. And we got into human intelligence, and of course our classic division is MI5 and MI6, home and, home and abroad, if you like. And the first major evolution was the Government Communications and Cipher School, which became GCHQ. That was when we were telegram native, if you like. Well, now we've got to be digital native. We've got to look at the reality that intelligence, the information that is publicly available, is the sort of thing that we need to be understanding to make sure that we're fully informed. We will talk about the the benefits of AI, what little we know of it already, but as, as that grows, the benefits of AI to national security. But what do you see as the downsides as you're building this architecture? So who's writing the code? Because there's going to be unconscious bias in those individuals as they build this machine that then goes out and looks for information. So what are the downsides to involving AI and machine learning in a system such as this? So look, I look at AI like I look at much of the rest of code. It's mathematics, frankly. And what you've got to do is you've got to make sure you're writing mathematics that answers your questions and doesn't distract you. Now, that's often the case with intelligence. Now, it's true that AI makes the volume greater. It's also true that code makes you able to source from more information and from more places. That's all true. But it's already true that there's an awful lot of information out there. And making sure you're filtering properly is basically the job of intelligence agencies and diplomats and indeed journalists. And so making sure that you're filtering is really difficult. Now, AI helps if you know what you're doing and it distracts if you don't. It's just a tool. Now, there are different questions that come with AI as to whether or not it may have bias in terms of interviewing candidates or discovering medical fixes or whatever it happens to be. Those are different challenges. I'm not going to go into them now. They're really for many other people as well. So in terms of the Ozint hub, can you talk about the size, who's going to be able to task it, who are the customers, oh, horrible clunky term, but who are the customers it, it will then support and what measures of effectiveness are you going to be able to use well look we're at an early stage on this i mean let's not kid ourselves that we've got answers to every question we don't at the moment because what we're trying to do is trying to understand how we structure ourselves to make sure that what we're doing is we're serving the need when i was in afghanistan many years ago rather longer than i choose to remember it was immediately clear that there were many areas of open source intelligence that we weren't using as effectively as we could, of public information, that we weren't using to make the case with local leaders or tribal elders, that we weren't always using to inform ourselves as effectively as we could. We focused, quite understandably, but we focused on the secret stuff. We focused on the stuff that came in the double vanilla envelopes and the security warnings. And the reality is that that world is still important but it's evolved. And when you look at what's happened, Bellingcat is the classic example, but actually there are many others. The New York Times, BBC have demonstrated. That world has changed. And what we need to do is we need to work out how we structure ourselves to use that public information, that publicly available information to inform ourselves and actually to inform others as well. And so that's where it's too soon to give you an answer on those. We're doing work on it at the moment. And I'm very pleased that we should have some initial responses in May, and we'll be talking to the Prime Minister about it. That's information going in, and you say work in progress on the information coming out, where that goes. Will any of it come to the public? Well, I hope so. That's exactly the point. Because if you look at the way in which intelligence matters, where it's used, there are really two ways. There's a small amount of intelligence, and it is a small amount, that really is only for informing one or two very tight groups of decision makers. But most intelligence 
is about shaping an argument. And in a democracy, that has to be done publicly. It just does. So if you look at, for example, what we did in the run-up to Ukraine, we opened up a lot of intelligence to partners around the world, but also to people in the United Kingdom, to colleagues of yours, perhaps even to you, to explain what we were seeing, why we thought the build-up of Russian forces was credible, why it was genuinely a threat to Ukraine, and why we were taking it so seriously. Now, we had to do there things that intelligence agencies don't traditionally do, which is actually declassify, actually open up. But what became obvious is that it didn't need to be secret intelligence that was declassified. In fact, if you look at the start of the war, the war began, as it were, or was acknowledged to have begun, not when we said it had begun or when a diplomat or even a journalist had said it started, but when a couple of guys in the United States at a college in the US looking on Google Maps saw a traffic jam on the way into Ukraine at four in the morning and realized that was a Russian military convoy. So just showing that already public information is able to inform national debate and able to inform dem democratic debate, what we need to do is make sure we're using it properly. Before talking about Ukraine specifically, just to just step back on the declassification of information, intelligence, intelligence being information plus assessment in my mind. So Skripal in 2018, I think was a turning point when the government needed to get information, very sensitive information, very quickly into the public domain. And of course, the first answer is, well, no, that can't happen. It's too sensitive to its government, I believe, said wrong. This is going to happen. Now work back and tell me how we do it. And you managed to get some, well, the government of the day managed to get some very, very sensitive information into the public domain in enough time to build that international consensus. Do you think that was an anomaly or is that business as usual now, that ability, that desire by government to get very sensitive information into the hands of the public. Are there still some outliers across government, maybe with allies, because it's not just our product, I presume, but resistance from cross government or, or with our partners for this kind of process of giving stuff to the public? Well, Don, what you're setting out is why public intelligence is so important, because you're absolutely right. We do work with allies. It's not a secret. You know, We have the Five Eyes allies, but we actually have many other allies around the world who we share intelligence collection and analysis with. And you're right. It's not just about the information. You've got to analyze it, make sure it's real, make sure it answers a question, and then it becomes intelligence. It's got to be usable. But it's not just that, because that, of course, can be constrained, because an ally may have a reason for keeping something back or for deciding that they don't wish to share the source or the way in which it was collected, and maybe the intelligence would give that away. So what we need to do is we need to find ways in which we can point out what's really happening in the world to people who need to know it in a democracy, that means our citizens, in ways that is usable. Now, you're quite right to talk about the Skripals, and you're absolutely right that the government was looking for ways to make sure that the information that we had was usable. But actually, if you look at the Skripals, it wasn't just us. You look at what Bell and Cat were able to find out about those two GRU officers. That wasn't us that did it. They did it with open source intelligence and some other things that they managed to get out of Moscow, but nothing to do with us. And they managed to get stuff not only on that, but on MH17, where they, you will remember, I think through things like Facebook, they followed photographs of various uh, convoys, including of that anti-aircraft missile system that shot down that okay. civilian airliner, the book, exactly, that shot down that Malaysian airliner. They did that through publicly available information. That wasn't us that did it. Now, I think that demonstrates what we need to be thinking about. Bellingham, and by the way, there are others, as I said, the BBC, New York Times, and others have done it too in different ways, have demonstrated why this matters. You know, if you remember the Andrew Marr interview, must be a couple of years ago, where he interviewed the Chinese ambassador to the United Kingdom, and he showed photographs of Uyghur citizens, Uyghur young men, being detained at a railway station in Xinjiang. And the Chinese ambassador claimed they weren't real, and the BBC done their homework and they were able to demonstrate using Google Maps and shadows and light and things like that to show that it was a photograph taken on a particular day at a particular time and the shadows and the light were definite and therefore it was this railway station at this time. That's the sort of thing that's very useful, but it's not the sort of thing that you and I can do by a simple Google search. 
you need to build up information. And that's what this hub is about. It's about training that expertise. Now, that expertise is a real skill. It's an incredibly important skill. But it's based on public information, so it's much more usable publicly. Now, on Ukraine, you said that the UK and US intelligence was shown to be pretty close to the mark after last year. Did that consign the shadow of Iraq and WMD into history once and for all? That was 20 years ago, and I'm not going to... But but the Russians and the Chinese still bring it up today as justification for either us not doing something or to justify their action. It, you know, it, 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 it isn't exactly surprising that dictatorships and authoritarian states that are seeking to hide things use any excuse to discredit others. That's not really a surprise, is it? What we've seen in Ukraine and the Russian aggression is that actually our agencies are very good at this. Working with friends and allies, we are able to understand what's going on in other people's governments and other people's military headquarters. And we are able to warn our friends and allies of dangers that are coming. And we do it because it's in our interest, of course, but it's also in the interest of our friends and allies around the world. And I think that's something that we've demonstrated in Ukraine. I think we've we've demonstrated that we are essential partners to our European friends and that we are really important allies to many around the world. But am I right in thinking there was some resistance across the European security architecture, some capitals that weren't entirely sold on the the intelligence you were giving them before February the 24th. So that suggests that there was a residual, we will we'll wait and see. There's always a debate. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that is often misunderstood. But you put it yourself very well when you said intelligence is the combination between information and assessment. Now, we can agree on the information and still disagree on the assessment. And that's part of the debate in the intelligence process. And what I think we demonstrated in Ukraine was that the UK was not only good at the collecting, finding the information, making sure it was accurate, but was also very good at the assessment. And you're right, other people disagreed with elements of the assessment, even if they agreed with the information. But I think we demonstrated that the UK is an important and trusted partner by many, many friends around the world, including in Europe because we're very good at both of those. And how will this hub fit into the European and indeed global security architecture? Well, a lot of that's still to be worked out. But I hope what we're doing, this is the first of its kind in the Five Eyes community, and I think the first of its kind in Europe. This is an opportunity for us to look at the way in which the UK is able to offer that element of support to our friends and allies, and that extra element of security to our country. That's exactly what my job is. That's why I'm so focused on it. And that's why after years of seeing how public information has shaped debates, has provided that information that then alongside assessment becomes intelligence, this is an opportunity for me as a minister now to make the change that I think is so important. You mentioned disinformation a while ago. So in that slice of the activity of the new hub as I've found on many many occasions when I go head to head with Russian trolls on social media and it's a great sport rather you than me yeah but trying to fact check countering nonsense with fact is like fighting smoke they'll just move they'll just move elsewhere and actually these groups like NAFO the um just meeting nonsense with nonsense seems a way to do it just wrap them up in in knots do you think that actually the the ability of this Aussie hub to challenge disinformation, if it goes down the fact-checking line, is just the wrong way to do it? I don't think it's the wrong way to do it. I think it's one of the ways to do it. You know, the Prime Minister asked me to set up the Defending Democracy Task Force, which the integrated was so important in not only supporting but boosting. And this integrated review actually really should be looked at, not as a refresh, but as a boost to the security apparatus that the UK is planning to have. And I think that's, I think it's a very, very important piece of work. I think the Prime Minister should be given huge credit for the effort that he put in, for the drive that he put into it. And actually, people like John Bew did so much work 
in making sure this was more than just an update, but it was a real rethink of some of those areas. And as part of that, we've spoken about the OSINT hub, but we should also talk about the defending democracy work. And that's where disinformation comes in, because it's quite clear to us that the ways in which we're being challenged around the world is not just military in the old sense. You know, you don't just wait for an army to turn up on the north coast of France and prepare barges to, you know, this isn't Napoleon in 1800, right? We're seeing our security undermined by the attempt to tear us apart, to spread disinformation, spread lies in our communities. And we see it through social media channels, and we're aware that some social media channels give control to foreign states who could, in theory, use it to promote divisive or problematic campaigns that would tear us apart. And that's why some elements of control, who publishes, who is the publisher behind a social media company, matters much more today than it may have done, you know, for a newspaper 20 years ago or 50 years ago. So what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we are structured to deal with information as it really is present today. And I think so Sint Hump is part of that, but the defending democracy work that I'm doing is also absolutely crucial to making sure that we're safe going forward. So it sounds like it's going to be a kind of nudge unit on steroids. No, I think you forgive me, I think you're interpreting it in in a single way. I think it's I think it's broader than that. The point about an OSINT hub is to make sure that open source intelligence is available to a digital native community in the same way in which telegram intelligence and wires intelligence was made open to a community a hundred years ago, or human intelligence at home and abroad was made open to intelligence communities years before that. And what we're looking at is a way to make sure that that vast quantity of open source intelligence, you know, there's some statistics that say 90 or 95% of all information is available publicly on, on the internet today in ways that, you know, years ago you had to, you know, go and search telephone directory by hand. So you had to go to the country. You had to have somebody there. You had to go through it. Now you can search almost everything, well, so many things online, that it means that that digital native community is what we're looking at. It's not just, it's not just a nudge unit. It's not just a disinformation unit. It's a way of making sure that you're informed properly about the world as it's going all around you. And you'll be able to do all that whilst maintaining sufficient transparency, trust of the public, and without allowing the algorithm to run off in its own way. Well, this isn't this isn't a, this isn't an AI bot scraping the data of the internet any more than any other form of collection is just a standalone box that collects. This is about understanding the world as it is. Now, that requires trained professionals. That requires people who understand what they're looking for. That requires human judgment, fundamentally. This isn't just some sort of, you know, algorithm. This is about human beings looking through open source intelligence that is now much more available than it was ever before and using it in ways that helps to inform the government, of course, but also British people and our friends and allies to keep us safe and to make sure we know what's really going on and not, as you rightly would say, be brought down by bots and trolls who are spreading right lies. And who's going to train those individuals that you just described or who's going to write the training programs for them? You're asking very detailed questions there. Look, we're doing that work at the moment and as soon as we've got better answers, as soon as we've got the answers, we'll be putting them through various different people because there's a there's a bunch of people who are already doing a lot of this work. You know, I've already cited the BBC and Bellingcat and New York Times. And there. there are many others around the world who are already doing a lot of this work. Thank you. Now, while I've got you, yesterday, or oh, yeah, what day is it? I don't know when this is going out. So on, um, I have to take my shoes off. What day is it? What was yesterday? Tuesday. Tuesday. MI5 raised the Northern Ireland terrorist threat level to severe, meaning an attack is highly likely. Should, in terms of managing expectations for the public, should we be thinking in terms of years or decades before Northern Ireland threat level will be the same as the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer because it depends on the decisions of a very, very small number of individuals who are making frankly, very bad choices. 
what we need to do is we need to make sure that we keep the whole of the UK safe. And I think what the government has done through the Windsor Agreement is to set the country, the whole country, on a path to a bit of in cooperation with our friends and allies around the European Union and around Europe. And it has already been seen by our friends in Dublin and indeed in the United States and in Europe as a way of making sure that we are cooperating long into the future. Now, I think that's a very positive agenda. I think the Prime Minister has done a fantastic job of making sure we're in the right place there. And all of that together will undermine the claims that some make to an alternative path. And I hope what we see is we see those who would turn to violence realise that leads nowhere. It only leads to misery. What we need is we need Northern Ireland to be a prosperous and happy part of the United Kingdom with its choices and with its ability to choose its own future. That's an important thing for all of us. And just finally, sticking with MI5 for a moment, Director General Ken McCullum, a couple of weeks ago, in response to the Manchester Arena inquiry, he apologised on behalf of his service for saying there were there were failings, there was information that, that wasn't given sufficient weight that had it done so it might have led to a different outcome. Do you think the, back to where we started, this open source intelligence hub would be able to, are you, are you trying to build something that would be able to find those kind of things and, and flag them up sufficiently for a human then to take greater notice of? So I'm not going to talk about the Manchester events specifically because they were all covered in the report and I think the inquiry really did an extraordinarily impressive piece of work in exposing the challenges that were faced, the problems that arose, and how we could do better in the future. But I think what is clear is that what the Director General did was recognise some of the areas where it went wrong, and I thought his apology, his public and very clearly heartfelt apology, was very powerful, because it demonstrated, I think, something that is well worth remembering, is that intelligence officers aren't people separate from our community that people like us right they're people who live in the UK who you know have family in the UK have friends in the UK and incidents like that test everybody in ways that are extremely demanding and it's true that sometimes we get it wrong what's important when we do is to make sure that we learn the lessons and I think the Director General has demonstrated that MI5 is a, a learning organisation that is really trying to do its best and is very conscious that when mistakes happen, they have really serious consequences. And is this Aussie hub that you're seeking to build one of the types of lessons that, that, that is just not necessarily from that directly, but is just readily apparent in 2023 that this is necessary, that, that can plug some of those gaps? So I think it's, I think it's apparent that but there is just a vast amount of information out there that, for very entirely appropriate reasons, agencies focus on other areas. They focus quite rightly on those secret areas, on those areas in the shadows, where only their special skills, only their unique capabilities can get us in to see what's really going on. There is, however, another world out there, a digitally native world, where there are so many things in the public domain that we also need to be understanding and understanding differently. And that's where we're looking to fill. Do you see the intelligence agencies being customers of this of this new body? It's way too soon to define relationships in any way. But what I do see is I see open source intelligence informing our intelligence collection, our intelligence analysis, and our government and public decision making. Thank you. So what's your next meeting? So my next meeting is actually about fraud. And the reason you may think that fraud under the security minister is an odd one, but the reality is we see a huge overlap between fraud, criminal groups, terrorist groups, and state threats. And so just as we see open source intelligence informing our intelligence capability, we see our financial networks and fraud within them supporting criminal and state threats uh, against us. So. I'm afraid the overlap is very strong. Tom Dugan, at Security Minister, thank you for talking to the Telegraph. Thanks. 
Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Rachel Duffy. <laughs>